When the TEDx organizers asked me what story I wanted to tell, I told them that I don't have a good story, and that's the price, precisely the point of why I'm giving this talk, because my background is like many of our students. I grew up in Lewiston, a small city not far from here, product of a middle-class family. Um, my dad was an auto parts salesman mechanic. My mom managed low-income housing for the state, and we really didn't get out a whole lot. So when it came time to go to college and apply, I didn't have that decisive story that was supposed to propel me through college and off into my career that many admissions staff are looking for. Luckily, I won a genetic lottery and uh, got a football scholarship that helped me to get my mechanical engineering degree, and um, I parlayed that into a PhD. And here I am now, an assistant professor, one year out from tenure, to tell you what the future of universities is going to be. The reality is I'm still working on that great story I want to tell you someday, but before we can get to that, we've got a big problem we need to address. Sir Ken Robinson's TED Talk, the most watched TED Talk ever, is just one of many on TED.com, emphasizing the need for change on the horizon here in academia. Class sizes are larger than ever, tuition is higher than ever, students are watching TED Talks in the middle of class. <laughs> What's the point of even going to class when you can watch interactive lectures online for free through professors at MIT or Stanford via tools like Coursera or the Khan Academy? Blood is already in the water. Google's head of people operations were on the record earlier this year to describe their hiring trends and how they're consistently moving away from GPA, high-ranking schools, clever answers to interview questions, and they're evolving away from collegiate degrees altogether. They don't even require them anymore. And what they're looking for are the people with the real-world experiences that have succeeded despite the system. Here we are now, a decade after Ken Robinson's talk, the traditional pillars that our university is founded on seemingly crumbling all around us. And many of you, like me, are wondering if we're wasting our time in a system that's soon to be outdated and replaced with this new era of online learning. The real question is that hasn't been addressed online through TED is what are we going to do with this? Do we recycle it? Do we just abandon it? I hope not because I think that would be a hugely wasted opportunity. And here's my radical hypothesis, that the future of universities looks like this. It's athletics. Now let me be clear, I'm not talking about the explicit games that are accomplished in athletics, but what I'm talking about is the exceptional model that athletics is for engaging students and the general community in our core university mission. Let me connect a few of the dots for you. A winning team in athletics, um, this is a study out earlier this year, um, we're talking a top 10 team in either basketball or football, causes a couple exceptional things to happen. It's, for one thing, a 10% increase in new student applications, and these aren't just any student applications either, these are quality students, um, as the average SAT score tends to increase by an equivalent amount. To cause that same level of change, we would have to do a couple of non-trivial things. We would have to fluctuate tuition or financial aid between 6 to 32 percent, or we would have to have our U.S. News and World Report ranking by, um, for instance, going from 20th to 10th place in the country. Not a small task. But it goes more than that. Athletics does a couple of other exceptional things. Um, another study out this year showed that just a 1% winning increase in a football team's win-loss record equates to nearly a half million dollars in alumni donations flowing directly to athletics. And these aren't just donations to athletics. There ends up being a positive spillover into the general academic fund. So everybody at the university ends up benefiting from this. And Athletics goes beyond that, too. It forms a giant feeder system going all the way down to peewee football in the little leagues where parents are getting their kids engaged early in the hopes that their kids can build up, eventually get a college degree, and maybe even make it into the pros someday. So this model that athletics um, demonstrates is able to leverage substantial resources from the community that we would not otherwise be able to accomplish. And so the real question is, can we get this model to work for research? And I think the answer to that question is a resounding yes. In 1996, Peter Diamandis organized the Ansari X Prize Challenge. This was a $10 million award to be the first non-government entity to build a reusable launch vehicle that could put a human into space twice over the period of two weeks. In 2004, Spaceship One, shown here constructed by Scaled Composites Corporation, succeeded in that challenge and claim the prize. In his 2005 TED Talk, Diamandis went on record to quantify the amount of resources leveraged to the initial investment in the prize challenge as being a 50 to 1 payback compared to some of our traditional research methods. 
And the federal funding organizations have taken note of this. DARPA in 2004 organized the Grand Challenge Competition. And this was a uh, $2 million prize to build a robotic vehicle capable of navigating a 130-mile course through the Mojave Desert completely autonomously without any human intervention during the race. And what's nice about this type of prize comp competition is that high-risk, high-reward types of research organizations like DARPA can offer up the prize competition, and if nobody succeeds in completing the task, they can retain that prize and then offer it up in subsequent years, like what happened in 2004. And in 2005, Stanley, shown here from Stanford University, succeeded and completed the task and claimed the prize. And you can see from the amount of sponsor decals, and even the vehicle itself, Stanford was able to leverage substantial resources from the community in order to get this challenge to happen. Um, what's more, uh, the competition would, was aired as the Great Robot Race on, um, um, on Nova, uh, had millions of viewers, received national media attention and worldwide media attention. So the amount of resources leveraged by DARPA from this were immense. Um, that was just the beginning, actually. The Grand Challenge led to the Urban Challenge, where they took the robots into the streets, which led to the Google's driverless car project, which has now logged hundreds of thousands of miles without intervention caused by the autonomy of the vehicle, and ultimately led to um, what Brand Farron called in his TED Talk earlier this year as the next wonder of the world, these types of driverless cars, because of their substantial ability to completely change how we interact with cities, the amount of pollution we create, and our productivity on our day-to-day -day commutes. So what is completely clear is that this competitive prize model has an ability to leverage both resources, media, and people that our traditional research models do not. And so the question is, what if your problem isn't so grand and you don't have a grand challenge you want to participate in? Well, actually, that's not so much of an issue anymore, as many of the professional societies are getting into the competition game as well, and it's likely you can find one that's of interest to you in your specific area. In my specific niche, niche research area of cryogenic hydrogen, um, we have the International Hydrogen Student Competition, um, which is held every year to solve timely challenges pertinent to the field. In 2012, we competed for the first time. It took second in the world to produce a um, system that um, generated heat, hydrogen, and power for the local university campus, and we used wheat straw biomass to do that. This year's competition to design a modular drop-on hydrogen refueling station um, was also a world finalist, and um, we uh, are going to find out here in a week and a half if we took the grand prize. But, but the point of it was, we need these types of systems to be able to drop onto an existing gas station to substantially expand the fueling infrastructure needed for the new vehicles coming out in a year and a half. And this type of competition was able to leverage substantial research and commitment in terms of design from the students to make it happen. The finalists from this competition um, were, um, are invited for submission in one of the most prestigious journals in my research area. The Department of Energy is following this up with a uh, funding opportunity that's a direct extension of the students' work, and they have something that they can leverage in future employment opportunities and go off into graduate school with. It's a win-win all around. But the question really is, you know, I didn't pay the students to participate in this. They didn't get course credit. So what's their motivation for participating in this type of competition without really a monetary incentive behind it? And Dan Pink, in his TED Talk a few years back, um, underscored this. And his TED Talk, titled The Puzzle of Motivation, shows that a lot of times we don't need financial incentive. And really, it's about having a grand puzzle out there that we're trying to solve that drives us to accomplish these things. And the potential for, while working on that puzzle, accomplishing the improbable at the same time. And sometimes, if, if it's just the puzzle that's needed, nature is capable of giving us plenty of puzzles and is sufficient competition in herself. In 2012, I got seed funding to um, take a student group and try to build the first liquid hydrogen-fueled unmanned aerial vehicle completely within the university. The resulting plane, called Genie, is shown in this video. been a win-win all around in, in terms of the initial investment that the college has given me because we've more than doubled it in terms of donations from industry and alumni. So <clears throat> with federal funding projected to remain flat in the near future, 
and the need to continually grow our R&D infrastructure. We need to look at recasting our existing infrastructure at the university to empower students to succeed in these types of grand challenges. And we need to consider a future of the university that looks like this. Homework will be real challenges that are being faced by the teams in real time on any given day. Tests are going to be real exhibitions of student achievement to the public and to other universities. Classrooms are going to evolve into maker spaces where we have 3D printers, wet, wet chemistry benches, the types of things to make things really quickly to test out if they're going to work later in the day. And professors are going to evolve into the role of coaches where we connect the right students with the right problems and the right resources to make it happen. And funding is going to end up being crowdsourced, flowing directly from industry and alumni through tools like Kickstarter and Rocket Hub that are already out there through the teams that they want to support, that they have a vested interest in the future in. And when we do this, we're going to substantially throw open the door to the feeder system at the K through 12 levels. It's already building with programs like Lego First, where we have students working in high school to do these technology challenges. This gives them an outlet to potentially get scholarships at key universities and fulfill key roles on the teams that they're, that's, they're going to get those stories to propel them through life. And when we do this, we're going to see something that's happening already in athletics. And that's a substantial leveling of the playing field across universities around the country and even within the university here because these types of challenges require diverse students. We need the business majors. We need the arts and the humanities. We need the sciences. These challenges are real and require many different participants in order to make them happen. And it's going to bring us together here in our universities. Because when we get up in the morning, we're not worried about whether something and what we're doing is going to be in our resume or our eulogy. We're worried about what's going to make the best story. And when we throw this down, a picture like this in front of a new potential employer or grandkids someday, we're wanting to say, let me tell you about the time I made this. Because the only time GPA and school ranking enter the equation is when we haven't done the freakishly awesome things that modern companies are looking for. The future here in universities it is bright and always has been. We're the hubs that connect the real people with the real problems and the real resources necessary for the real stories. And our future at the university remains in this role. And we hope that the students who are courageous enough to put their game on the line and participate to accomplish the improbable will tell us those stories someday through TED. Thank you.